I will take us through the commodities markets and uh, particularly as that iron ore price remains the focus ahead of this week's budget to Peter O'Connor joining us from Shore and Partners. Peter, terrific to talk to you this afternoon. Likewise, good to be back. That, um, I mean, some of those commodity prices are just uh, quite incredible at the moment, aren't they? Talking copper and iron ore in particular as they you know, continue to push ahead. They are in the space of just over a year. In the case of copper, it's doubled or more than doubled and iron ore has uh, done something similar as well. So extraordinary moves. But uh, given what your last uh, commentator was just talking about, liquidity is key and risk assets have been buoyed by that liquidity in the global markets and they'll continue to do so whilst that liquidity is there. And that backdrop supports the sector that I cover, which is the mining space. So um, those, what I call the reflation trade assets, particularly iron ore has got a lot of the headlines specifically leveraged to China, but there's that whole basket, which is the base metal stocks that leverage to the global recovery as well. And that's copper stocks, aluminium stocks, nickel companies, the lithium plays, and the big cap miners, BHP and Rio are thrown in as well. And a uh, more obtuse company, Luca Resources, who does uh, mineral sands are potentially rare earth. So that reflation basket's had a, a great backdrop, particularly since November last year. Uh, the iron ore has been running since prior to that with different supply issues, but yeah, it's been a very buoyant market and likely to do so um, whilst that liquidity stays there. All right, let's talk about some of those specific stocks then. Sandfire uh, in the copper space is one that I know you like. Is it still in your portfolio? It is. Uh, look, I like to look for things that look cheap relative to their peers that haven't performed yet. So it's a story about what I can make from here, not what's already happened. And Sandfire fits that category. It's trading at a discount to what would be regarded as fair value. And it hasn't performed as well as its peer, and its peer in this case is uh, Oz Minerals. And it's starting to close that gap. It's the best performing top 30 miner post their production reports last month. It's up about 25% as of Friday's close, obviously doing better today as well. So that gap's closing. So the, the best leverage to an operating asset in Australia in copper, it's been a great story, Oz Minerals, but the one that's cheaper right now is Sandfire. And it's got a, a asset base, which if they just closed down today and sold everything off and gave their cash back, it's still worth about 50% more than what the company's trading at. So um, significantly cheaper than what it should be trading and uh, a great opportunity on the back of this liquidity thematic and reflation trade. And it stands out to me as, as a great pick in that sector. So yes, Sapphire's still one of my key bets or s picks and it's in that cheaper part of the uh, quadrant that I like to look at. So uh, definitely one of the top picks. Okay, looking a little more broadly now, South 32, one you've been looking at. What are your thoughts? Yeah, likewise. Coming out of the reporting season, four names stood out out of the top 30 miners. Sandfire I've just mentioned, South 32 you've brought up, but also Aluka and Evolution. So quite a diverse array of stocks, but companies which delivered well for the quarter just gone, gave upgraded guidance for the quarter and the year ahead, and have a commodity tailwind like most, which is uh, looking quite favourable as well. But in the case of South 32, some important catalysts, very, very uh, near term. In their case, it's related to coal. Uh, they're getting out of coal in South Africa. They've been trying to do that now for nearly two years. So it's getting closer, but uh, we can't put a date on it yet. But when they do exit that business, it's uh, a huge change to their existing portfolio. It takes the drag of coal away, both from an ESG perspective, but more so a cash perspective. It drains several hundred million dollars worth of cash per year, and also ties up a lot of liabilities for future rehab. So as the company unf unwinds that when they do complete their sale, hopefully over the course of this current quarter. They'll be able to look at their balance sheet, look at their capital management program. They've got an active buyback program, one of the few in the space. They'll look to top that up, either between uh, now when they make an announcement and September when their program needs to be updated. And that could include special dividends, could include a buyback top up, and uh, there are more catalysts coming behind that as well. So of the bigger miners, it's the cheaper one in that group of BHP, Rio, Fortescue, Etc. And it's got a commodity suite which is enjoying that reflation trade, and it's got a specific capital management um, catalyst potentially in the very near term as well. So, like where South 32 is trading also. So, um, another mm. one of the key bets coming out of the um, just recent quarter reporting season. And Peter, um, as we're mentioning there, iron ore stocks really on a fly today. Um, Fortescue up more than seven percent. BHP three and a half. Uh, Rio four and a half. What is your outlook then? for iron ore, given the record price we're seeing right now, and of course we keep hearing that the later half of the year, there'll be significant pressure on the price, particularly as far as demand from China's concerned. 
I'm in that camp. So um, I think it's a very, very divided market. So either you think that iron ore is peaking at some stage, whether it was about to peak, peaking now, or soon to peak, and then those that think it's stronger for longer and this whole reflation trade and super cycle will take it higher. But the market will adjust in iron ore, and that's more a medium term thematic, but iron ore price will be back sub $100 and probably closer to $50 at some stage between now and 2025. The inflection point for what drives it, that's the hardest thing to pick right now. So we're in a market which is very squeezy, very tight both on supply and also demand. So um, the move we've seen just in the last week since I spoke to you in iron ore price has been extraordinary, literally um, I think 10% or more in just uh, five trading days. So um, that's what happens when markets get this tight. So where does it go from here? We're enjoying the strongest or the peak demand season, particularly out of China and out of the Northern Hemisphere. So that's driving steel demand and steel price. And with that comes steel uh, margins for the steel makers. And they're enjoying at the moment somewhere between about $150 and $200 margin. With that, they're able to pay more for iron ore to feed into orders for steel. So whilst that continues, we won't likely see an inflection point just yet. But going to the third quarter of the year, which is a softer period for demand in the Northern Hemisphere and a continued strong period for supply, we could start seeing the iron ore price um, find some form of equilibrium. But again, short term, it's trying to pick that demand supply inflection, but medium term, absolutely, I think the, the weight of um, analysis is behind the view that iron ore will be trading at a, a deep discount to where it is today. Peter, great to check in with you this afternoon from Shaw and Partners.